You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, welcome again to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. And what a week it has been. We've got a ton to talk about, like season two, Umbrella Kids. Am I right? (laughs) No time for that. Sorry. Sorry. We're not that show. So, yes, welcome here to Snarky Faith, a show where we talk about faith and spirituality, especially Christianity, through the lens of rational thought and a bit of sarcasm and snarkiness. So if you're new to the show, just warning you here that we're going to be talking through a lot of different topics and that if you're not well-versed in sarcasm, you may have a problem because we're here to talk about faith and spirituality without the BS that we've become accustomed to. Now, if you are new to this show, just a reminder that you can catch this broadcast and all podcasts at www.snarkyfaith.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, We're even on YouTube and other places like that, too, even in India. So, hey, weird, weird. If you ever want to reach out to the show, I'm always available at questions at snarkyfaith.com. I love to talk to listeners, (laughs) people that hate the show. I talk to everyone. That's just what I do. And we also we also have something that I <laughs> I started a while back, but I will admit I have not pushed on the show because I kind of forgot that I started it, even though it's on the website. We have a Snarky Faith hotline, a Snarky hotline, 919-525-1570, where you can leave your voicemail messages on our show. You can talk about why you like the show, why you hate the show, questions you've got, and, and just give shout outs on the air because they will most likely I'll... I'll put you on the air. Good or bad, I like it all, but we want to give you guys an outlet to be able to give a shout back to the show just like this. I actually got one of these the other day, so I'm going to share this with you. It was pretty cool. Hi, Stuart. My name is Olivia, and I'm in the midst of deconstruction. Um, Well, I've been on my journey for, I would say, three, four years, and the broadcast every week, um, I uh, listen to it uh, via YouTube because I'm a YouTube premium person and I just love how uh, they have that set up. Anyway, I listen to Snarky Faith on um, YouTube and really look forward to it. Um, what I would say is that it helps me bit by bit, a little bit more each week to heal and to move forward because my hope is that I'll have a rich and vibrant faith at the end of this journey and not um, be someone who is spiritually bereft and just left out um, (laughs) twisting in the wind. Uh, So um, I have a wonderful faith community that I'm a part of that is progressive and supports um, my journey. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of it is interior and I mean, it's all really interior. And so hearing you every week talk about whatever happened that week in the news, which is bizarre usually and joke about it and laugh about it and just tell it like it is really helps me. It just helps me heal so much. And, um, thank you. I mean, I'm, um, going to be 63 this month and I'm kind of alone in what I'm going through so listening to uh, uh, your broadcast for an hour a week helps me to feel far less alone so thank you I consider you uh, in many ways, my pastor. So thank you so much. Olivia, Olivia, thank you so much for your brave words and for sharing your part of the journey. I love being able to hear 
for listeners that are going through the same thing. I too, I feel alone in this. And this is like why I'm doing this. Uh, I, I think that it is important for us to be able to have people to help us to realize that we're not crazy. We're not crazy. We're not part of the Christian crazy, but that life moves on and that Jesus still matters and that there is still goodness in the world around us. So Olivia, thank you. Because you keep me going. And I really do. I, I actually, I know, I know, I, I sometimes get my radio voice when I say that, but I'll say I sincerely appreciate it. And I really, really do. I really, really do. So, Olivia, you are awesome. Continue on being amazing. I look forward to more conversations with you, too. So, I'm not quite sure how to do this because we're going from something very tender and beautiful and heartwarming to something like, oh no, here it is. <laughs> We've got some breaking news here coming out here on the show. That's I feel like I need to be talking about because there has been a there's been a large dust up over at Liberty University. Oh no. But first before we talk about Jerry Falwell, I have to give a shout out to another listener of mine. Hey John. I love John. John writes me often and John asked me this wonderful question the other day. That he noticed, which has led to people in my family now, immediate family making fun of me. I love it, John. I am not bitter at any any of this. So I'm going to share this with everybody because I just I do this on the show. So John had uh, had written me, and he does quite often. John is just is awesome. Um, and one question he had, and John always has great questions. He said he said he was asking me what my what my ancestry was, and I was kind of like, what? Like, okay, uh, because he asked me. Because I always said Jerry Faldwell Jr. I put a D in it. And so he was trying to ask me, like, trying to figure out where, where my dialect or where I was coming from, where I would throw a D randomly into it. And it reminded me, I was like, oh, my goodness, because this kind of goes back to some of my Southern Baptist roots. Because my father, who, and, and I'm going to say, my father is a very, very intelligent man. So I'm not, this is no insult to his intelligence. But my father is also from Louisiana. So being from Louisiana, he oftentimes... As some part of his Louisiana heritage, I'm going to give some of that credit and also just some of my dad's, like, ness of being my dad. He oftentimes has his own way of pronouncing things. And so growing up a child of promise keepers in the moral majority, I, oh, my dad somehow always called senior Jerry Faldwell. Uh, and so I always heard his kid Jerry Faldwell, not is Jerry Falwell. So John... I thank you for, for pointing this out. And I tell everyone else this because I have some others too. I am terrible. I worked on phonics, did, was not there for me as a child. So <laughs> if I have any other weird quirks or pronunciation issues, go ahead and send them to me at questions at snarkybait.com. I love to talk about them. It's all love. So it's great. So sorry. I started off with a red alert to really talk about Jerry Falwell Jr. and what's happening over at Liberty University. Now, we're going to unpack this. And depending on how much time we have, this may be the Christian crazy. It's, we still have a lot of Christian crazy, but I'll see what I can fit in. But, okay. So let me run through what has happened, my friends. And for some of this, I'm going to be quoting extensively from an article from Religion News Service uh, called Jerry Falwell Jr. is taking an indefinite leave of absence from Liberty University amidst calls to step down. Dang it, the title stole my thunder by Emily McFarland Miller and Jack Jenkins. Thanks a lot, guys. No, but (laughs) okay. so I'm going to read you what happened and then I'm going to do something you're not expecting. Because for those of you that know the show, Franklin Grahams and, and Jerry Falwell Jr.'s and all those, you know I'm not a fan. You know, like, I am the antithesis of fan. I'm going to, in a small way, bizarrely defend him in a tiny way. Okay, but first to the facts. So, from the article, quoting it here. Jerry Falwell Jr. is taking an, quote, indefinite abs- leave of absence from his role as president from Liberty University. Insert applause. The article continues. Uh, Calls for Faldwell's resignation have grown this week since the university's president posted and quickly deleted a photo of himself on Instagram with his arm around a woman who is not his wife. (gasps) Clutch the pearls! That part was not part of it. 
Uh, continuing on, both had their pants on zips, midriffs, and underwear visibly. Balwa had a glass of what he described as black water in the caption, noting it was not alcohol, only a prop only, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> okay, so Falwell has had another kerfuffle where he had posted something he shouldn't have posted on Instagram, and it was seemed really weird and pervy and dubious, and I'm going to let the article finish before I give my part here. So, so that's what happened recently. So the article is going to continue and talk about the things that has ha- have happened with Falwell's leadership. Okay. Back to the article. Quote, controversy over Falwell's leadership dates back years. Other evangelicals and even Liberty University students have expressed frustration as far back as 2015 when Falwell stood before the student body and responded to the news of a terrorist attack by reaching for a firearm he claimed to have had holstered in his back pocket, suggesting that students carry guns so, quote, we could end those Muslims before we walk in. Falwell also, if we remember really supported Trump's response to the hateful and racist attacks at Charlottesville, Virginia, calling them bold and truthful. Oh, that's very good. And I also bring this up because, because, back in 2018, the Red Letter Revival was uh, was held by the Red Letter Christians uh, near Liberty's campus. I was there with my friend uh, Christopher Maloney and, and one of my sons, um, and it was uh, equal parts, as they were saying, like tent revival protests also rallied against what Faldwell was doing. But also, um, at the same time, Faldwell had stifled the efforts of people to be able to go from this group to be able to pray on campus with other students. Um, in a time where, uh, yes, I think where, where peace was needed, he was actually being a strong arm authoritarian and not allowing anyone else on campus. Now, um, Falwell has lots of issues, uh, not even getting into his family history and everything else. But this is the thing that actually gets me. And I feel like this is, if anyone remembers, like watching The Untouchables, the movie with Kevin Costner about uh, the fall of Al Capone, that Al Capone did many horrible things, but was snagged on tax evasion issues. And so I really think this is interesting here because people don't understand the photo. Sadly, I understand the photo that is in question. You can look it up. And I'm actually going to slightly defend him. I am not defending the fact that he is on a yacht partying with some other staff members. Not defending that. Not defending anything about Falwell Jr. Except the fact that why was he dressed like that? Because... He and his yachting friends were having a Trailer Park Boys-themed party. And if anyone understands who the Trailer Park Boys are, uh, when you kind of look at the pictures and the other pictures that are involved in the situation and context, you're kind of like, uh, yeah, actually, I, I actually, oh, Falwell is very stupid. But this was actually not that big of a deal, even though it is bad for PR and everything else. Yes, he is dressed up like a sleazy person for whom he's playing. He is also a sleazy character in real life. I don't, so yes, so Falwell is a sleazy character in real life playing a sleazy character from fiction. It's it's very complicated, but at the end of all of this, what I will say to you is, hey, 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 if we're moving him away from liberty, uh, that's a good thing because he has been very viral and toxic and terrible that is the legacy of the Faldwells is simply just being viral and toxic and disgusting. But in a weird way, oh, 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 if I can quote bubbles from the trailer park boys, Jerry Faldwell Jr.'s biggest issue is being greasy. So while I apologize to all of you for actually in a weird, weird, weird moment defending Jerry Falwell Jr., eh, at least you'd get some points for kind of keeping it real because as far as scandals go, he's had way bigger ones that have not taken him down. But this one, <laughs> I'll take it. And now huh? we're going to move to the section that's going to be very brief today called the Christian crazy, where we talk about the insanity in Christianity because it shouldn't be. 
Christianity should not be insane, but it is, and that's where we're at, so here we go! Claude Hammers, the Lord is my shepherd, he know what I want. To. So this week in the Cursed and Crazy, we've got kind of like a shoot-off. Uh, we don't have much time, because there's a lot of show ahead. So we're going to spin the wheel of the Christian crazy and see who gets picked to be the craziest of the week. So the winner, the winner is Christopher McDonald. All right, you little weird pervy man. You've won something! So tell us something truly crazy this week. And this is Chris raging against masks and why they're evil. I saw somebody posting about the goggles. Folks, they're, like, if they got you to wear the little cloth, do you think it's going to be hard for them to make you wear those goggles? No. And then when they, stop, when they start making you wear the goggles and everybody starts wearing those without fighting it back about it, they're going to start making you wear the hijab. I see where he's going to this. They're going to make you wear the hijab first, and then they're going to have, like, no shirt, no shoes, no service. This is just unbiblical. Unbiblical! It is. So unbiblical. Sorry, continue on here, Chris. The Islamic thing, ladies, they're going to put you in Islamic garb. And before you know it, ain't none of you going to be wearing anything but the state uniform of the Gestapo Communist Party of America. So sorry, ladies. Fall fashion's all Gestapo chic for you. Oh, someone got a little early here. It's a sneak peek on the fall fashion. Gestapo sexy. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? What? How did we go from wearing a mask to wearing goggles? I, I First of all, that's a weird leap. To then a hijab, and then the gest I don't Chris, 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 Chris. You're nutty. You're nutty, and that's why we love you. You're just a little racist man that thinks Jesus cares about your racism. But let's move on. So the main story for this week. I want to talk to you about getting saved. Right? Come on, I need to talk to you about a little friend I have named Jesus. Or maybe I should start this with, do you, do you know where you're going after you die? Are you going to heaven? Are you going to hell? So today we're going to have a talk about salvation. Now, when I mention that, it's not the conversation you think I'm going to have. Now, as soon as I said that, you're like, no, it's not that one either. No, it's not the third one either. So stop, 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 stop. This is a conversation that doesn't really... That doesn't really happen very often, but I think this is one that we, we need to do. I, th I think we need to have a conversation where I'm not going to use scripture. What? Huh? What? Can we do that? Can we talk about salvation without talking about scripture? Ah! We're going to try. Because uh, here's what I want to do. I, I, know, I know that when we, when we get into this, these conversations about... Uh, salvation that we can we can get very problematic when we start to use scripture because again different denominations different um tribes will use different scripture to prove their different points in this and, and I, I actually don't i that's why i i'm actually going to do something a little bit weirder because one thing that i have i've learned and this may come as something that's very counter to christian culture or really just this isn't necessarily historical biblical culture, but I really feel like this is kind of more uh, Christian culture that believes this idea that if it's going to be from God, it has to somehow be weird. And and I want to counter that because I also think that God is fairly logical and straightforward and reasonable uh, when he tells people that, you know, the two greatest commandments, when he tells people through Jesus, the two greatest commandments uh, of the law to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, body and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. I think that's very that's a that's a huge that's a huge statement. Those two things to love God and to love uh, people. Those those are very simple, simple things that are requested of us as Christians. But they're very, very difficult ones to do because this whole idea of love, uh, <laughs> we don't always want to do it. But 
My point being is that when you read through, a l- I actually find Jesus fairly straightforward and logical. I think he makes sense um, as you begin to walk in his way of compassion and grace. And so I want to talk about salvation. I want to talk about this whole salvation conversation through the lens of God's creation, a.k.a. the crown of his creation, that when God made it, he said it was good and very good, humanity. Because if we are made in God's image, if we are made to be somewhat in an echo of the divine, uh, that would mean that we also are capable of being able to use our brains in ways that are logical and reasonable as we begin to look at conversations of salvation. So I know this is very counter because typically when we talk about salvation, uh, we're going to be talking about things in the spiritual realm. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about all this. I know, I know, I know, I know. And you're talking to a person. You're talking to a person who, who, who spent eh, just under 10 years working for an evangelistic organization. Okay. So yes, 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 yes. I understand that. And, and, and um, all of this comes from an article that I, I read this week that really got me thinking about this. Well, really think about that we need to have a conversation about salvation in a different way. And the article uh, is over on Patheos called Does Getting Saved? Uh, Does Getting Saved Stunt Our Spiritual Growth? By Jason Elam from Messy Spirituality. So we're going to use that one as a bit of a launching off point. But I also thought I needed to give you a little bit of my back, 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 back background in this. So this isn't my background where I've done work and where I've worked in ministry. No, this is my back, 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 So I'm going back to the age uh, where I'm around five or six. And so I remember as, as a little kid being able to hear stories about Jesus and, and probably a lot of this from my Southern Baptist upbringing, I knew that Jesus wanted to do good things and wanted us to do good things. And I was like, sweet, I like doing good things. I like trying to help people. Uh, at the same time, uh, this idea, again, since we're Baptists, and Baptists like to obsess, and because, again, they've got, like, some sort of a kink about hell. And so Baptists love to talk about it, love to talk about it. They love to hate talk about it, where you're kind of like, are you really into hell? Like, you talk about it a lot. I'm beginning to think you kind of have a little bit of a hell kink. I don't know. May I don't know for how much you're obsessed with it. But they are. They're obsessed with it. And And so I remember... I remember one night when uh, I remember actually sitting and talking to my mom one night when I was when I was little and saying, "Yeah, I I've heard all of this and I, I like what Jesus tells us to do, and I'm also this idea of hell. It seems pretty rotten and terrible. Um, not a fan. Um, what I didn't tell my mom was at the same time, I remember sitting in church because again we were when I was younger. I was in church way too much. I remember sitting in church on a Sunday night." And hearing the pastor talking about how heaven would be like the service we were attending forever, meaning that we would get to sing hymns off key, be in a sweaty old Baptist church in Roswell, Georgia, and in uncomfortable outfits, and sit in those pews and sing bad songs forever. Amen! (laughs) Well, but then in my little man's mind also, hell, torment, that sounds worse And I do like Jesus, so if he's the guy in charge, you know, I think I'm in on this. And I remember praying to accept Jesus in my heart and this this concept as as a little kid. And I was like, cool, I'm awesome. Like, I like this. I like this Jesus thing, and I like the idea of praying. Because for me, it was also, (laughs) I can talk to God anytime. Wow, that's awesome. But I was also a shy kid, so probably if you gave me an invisible person to talk to when I was really little, (laughs) I was all in. But the problem came here with my salvation. This is, this, is, this, is, this is my first of many hiccups in my road of salvation. I remember, um, so five years old, we were all like awesome, no one worried about it. So then my family moves again. And then we get into more of the deep south. And then as I begin to grow up and uh, I hear from church is that it's not good enough for you to pray to accept Jesus into your heart, but you also need to make a public declaration. Now, being raised Southern Baptist, that meant there was a lot more paperwork. Southern Baptists are kind of like, I feel like they are the, they're like the IRS of Christians. They're, they're very good at paperwork and minutia 
and really making spirituality granule and as much fun as filling out your taxes. So yes, profession of faith is in the Bible. Great. So then my father tells me, all right, are you a Christian, son? Yes, I prayed to accept Jesus in my heart years ago. We're all good. Good. It doesn't really count until you walk down at the end of a church service. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, it doesn't like take if you don't go down. But dad already did this. I prayed, God knows. No, 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 no. We have to make a public declaration of this. (sighs) Again, I mentioned earlier, I was a shy child. I didn't like being in front of crowds. So let alone in a large Southern Baptist church, you having to walk down at the end and having everyone staring at you and everyone wondering why you're going down front. Uh, Because sometimes people go down front because they needed to recommit their lives to Jesus because that meant they did something bad. But if you had gone down and made a new commitment to Jesus, that also got meant that you got taken aside into the back room if your parents would collect you after the service or assuming if you were an adult... (laughs) I don't think parents would collect you, but that's what I remember as a kid. So the pastor goes into the normal thing. We start singing the last song. They start doing this over and over and over again. Oh, come down, come down, come down. My parents are nudging me. I don't want to go. I eventually go, walk all the way down, and I probably freeze up. The guy knows why I'm down there, takes me to the back room. You pray to accept Jesus. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I've already done that. Let's do it again. All right, so we got to make sure it takes. Man, awesome. So what that then leads me to is a conversation with my pastor, which is also scary. Again, I'm talking, I'm a youngin. So wait, what? So I'm still not a Christian yet? No, then I had to talk to my pastor about it. And then when you talk to the pastor about it, he tells you that you have to make another public declaration because apparently the first one, that was like a pre-declaration. And I really started feeling that this was like a timeshare event. Like I get a free cruise, but I have to sit through the meetings and be a part of it. Was, it was getting lengthy at this point. And I'm also a little kid. So I have to have a meeting with the pastor. Pastor then tells me, I eventually then need to get baptized for all of this to take. I say this entire story because what a weird process to enter someone into a faith. I'm just wanting to call this out on, on, on just, just, just a human level here. How bizarre is that? Now, I know some people are like, God's ways are not our ways, Stuart. They're not the same. God works in mysterious ways. Sure. But again, these ways aren't necessarily that mysterious that we have laid out in front of us. We've actually just really made them some sort of an accountant's wet dream. Because somehow that's what St. Peter wants in heaven is the accounting books on who is in and who is out. And we really, really got to make sure they're really, really in. They've checked off every box before we really go. We're going to let them in. And even then, even then, even then, you don't know. Because I want to juxtapose that with another story that stuck with me. And this is when I was a little older. I remember when I was around 15 years old, same church. I remember uh, one of my friends that I'd grown up with. um, I'd known him for a number of years. Uh, Sad story. Father suddenly has a heart attack. And then we kind of go into the grieving mode to be there with the family. And they knew my dad. My dad was like the chairman of deacons of our church. And so he was there a lot trying to to walk these... uh, really just this grieving family through this. But the weird part was this. I remember that the family found his childhood Bible, this man that had passed. And there was a commitment card that was written and signed and checked off for when he was in vacation Bible school at the age of six. They found it somewhere, dusted off somewhere in the back. And then at that moment, the entire funeral, like, like, like the whole mood changed. And everyone was like, oh, 
we know he never went to church. I mean, his kids went to church. He didn't go to church. He never went to church. <laughs> oh, but we saw his commitment card. We have the receipts. See, Jesus, suck it. Let him in. He's got the receipts. So I bring up, I bring up these two very odd stories from a child. And I understand growing up within a Baptist mentality of this, but again, I will also tell you, I've worked as, <laughs> I've worked as youth pastors in charismatic churches, uh, non-denominational churches, and with Baptist churches too. So I know the spectrum, and actually Methodist churches too. So yes, I know the spectrum of BS that we throw at our kids, trying to make them in our image. Because parents essentially just want to feel that the kids are all right. They don't want to invest too hard in it, but they just want to make sure that the boxes are checked and the kids are all right. Because salvation, really in the American Christian context, is all about insurance. That's why we buy insurance. We buy insurance for the uh uh-oh in life. Like when something's going to go wrong, oh, at least you have insurance. And so we do this with faith. Oh, well, did you pray a prayer? (laughs) All you got to do is pray the prayer and you are good for life. But a lifehood where people will judge every move as you're long as you're part of the Christian church. If you step away from that, even though you made a commitment to Jesus, the Baptist would tell you if you really made a real commitment that you God has you for life and you can't evoke that. You can't walk away from that. But 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 we will still talk about you as being someone who's walked away from the faith, talk bad about you and gossip about you and all those other kind of things, which is really just all part of the <laughs> it's part of the Christian package. Yay. What's your point, Stuart? I'm getting to it, Stuart. Thank you. So my point is this, that we've made spirituality weird. We've made faith in Jesus weirder than it needs to be. I mean, the inherent nature of faith, the idea that we're believing in something that we can't see, um, we're trusting in something that we are not completely certain of, but we are putting certainty into that. So the idea of that, it, that very nature also lends itself to uh, a lot of vulnerability. Like we're, we, we are leaning on something that we say is certain, but we are not positive it's certain, but faith says we're positive it's certain. Yeah, it's kind of weird and circular. But, but, but. So here's what I'd like to do uh, for part of this conversation. I'm going to, and, and, and again, feel free. <laughs> feel free to disagree with me. Feel free to write me and call me a heretic. Feel free to write in seriously questions at snarkyfaith.com. If you are angry with what I'm going to say next or anything else of that nature, Dude, let me have it. I'm totally fine with it. I'm open to this. I'm actually open to dialogue about this. But I'm going to give you a more, because this is what I'm leaning towards, a logical conversation about what salvation is and what salvation isn't. Uh, and and I'm basing this upon uh, seminary degrees, uh, growing up in the church, reading the Bible, living in this, being in ministry, being a pastor. It does not make me an expert. It does not make me an expert. I just know that I've had a certain amount of experiences, and I'm just going to talk about my experiences. And so this is where I have derived where I am at through my experiences and through your experiences. You may want to argue and tell me that I'm all wrong, and I am open to it, and I, would, and I welcome it. But here's what I think about salvation. I think salvation through Jesus works like this. I think that it is easy for us as humans to assume that the world is against us, that there is is a greater power and that that is against us because life is hard. And in turn, what we try to do is to assign personalities and roles to God that are more pagan than they would be scriptural by listening to Jesus, meaning that Oftentimes, I think that we, we operate with this core idea kind of that's very, very like old and pagan, like, uh, ooh, good crops, God happy, bad crops, God unhappy. And I know that we say that that's not true, but I think a lot of us act almost superstitious like that. Like we have to continue to appease the gods to make them happy. Now, we have Jesus come along, where I really believe that Jesus came in here as a clarifying statement on the Old Testament, uh, where Jesus was came in to be able to say, yeah, here's what you guys got right, but I want to focus in on some of the stuff you missed. And, and what we see Jesus is doing here is, is reframing of the way a lot of the Old Testament was, was read and written, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a reminder to return to the attributes of, of compassion and love 
and hope and grace. That the center of, the center of knowing God is the same as knowing love. So God is love. Okay, so we have that there. We have that there. So number one, the thing that we should remember is God is love. Number two, Christian scripture and history would tell us that uh, we are made in God's image. So that God is a God of love, that we are made like God in God's image. So God is love, that we are made to love. And then Jesus reminds us that, that in order to kind of be a part of this, this idea of the kingdom of God, that kingdom of God is, is, is here to be able to spread this idea that we need to heal the brokenness in the world around us, heal those that have been hurt or, um, or mistreated or maligned or demoralized to help people to begin to see that they are loved and they are made in God's image. So that's also returning dignity to people. So a lot of the job of the kingdom of God, if you so choose to follow after Jesus, ha-ha, right? The whole praying the prayer thing, I'm, I'm less concerned with. I, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I really believe the call of Jesus kind of goes back to how he did when he talked to his disciples very early on. These men were fishing. Jesus talked to them. He performed a miracle. And he's like, hey, if you guys are interested in this, come follow me. And many of the disciples dropped what they were doing and followed after Jesus. That was it. It wasn't a pray the prayer. It wasn't a, uh, something that was, that was overtly, overtly spiritual or anything else of that nature. It was simply, this is a way of commerce that you are doing life, where you are, are, are doing things very capitalistically. You are, you, are, you are working a good trade, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to be a part of God's kingdom, which, which works on different currencies, hey, follow me. So he offered people a different way. He didn't tell people, if you don't follow me, hell. No. Jesus was always offering a new way of repentance, repentance simply being not like sin, but simply being, hey, there's probably things that you're doing that are not good for yourself and are probably not good for the people around you. And in this idea where God's kingdom is involving an ethic of love, those things where you're either hurting yourself or hurting others, that's not good for you or anyone else. So we can do something new where instead of hurting, we help people and we work for a common good for all so that through this, through these acts of kindness and goodness and grace, it leads us to a place where we begin to see healing in our communities and beyond. So the way I've just laid this out, I find this, I find this incredibly logical. Jesus calls people to live to a different standard that involves being selfless, and uh, loving other people self-sacrificially. And that through doing that, you are freeing other people from the abuse, from the labels, from the lies that they've been told that tear them away from God. Because life is hard, and oftentimes we find, can easily find ourselves <laughs> uh, being our own worst enemy or saying that we're not worthy enough to be able to be loved by others, especially loved by God. But that message of God also contains the message that God says, hey, I love you. I love you where you're at. I know I have to fix all this guy. No, 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 no. What are you talking about? I, I, no, I, I loved you five minutes ago. I loved you 10 years ago. I love you now. I love you moving forward. I'm cool with you. I want you to do things that are healthy and better for yourself as you move forward. And I want to try to make sure that you're doing good things and helping to lift up other people. But hey, that's like, it just makes the world a better place. But instead, I was raised in a situation that it was, all, it was a system, right? You had to do a thing. You had to walk through these steps, right? And then you just joined a club. So you joined a club, which to stay in good, good graces with this club, you got to go on Sunday, Sunday night if you're really good. Wednesday, come on right? And then you've got to memorize scripture and you have to do all this. It's all about doing stuff. And all of those pursuits that I've talked about are inward. Me, 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 me. Where do I go when I die? What do I need to do to make God happy with me, me, me? But if God already loves us, why do we need to spend time tearing ourselves down and constantly looking for sin inside of ourselves as opposed to saying, God loves me and I'm going to go try and do good and help people? Because guess what? 
what I found in this whole idea, when we make everything in life all about this weird spiritual nature of sin, sin's bad, Satan, 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 all that kind of stuff. You know what sin is? Sin really is just selfishness. If you want to call it that, that is, I mean, sin is selfishness. It's when we regard ourselves higher than we regard the common man. That's selfishness. I mean, sin boils down to that. So if sin is selfishness, God is love, and God is calling us to try to help each other, to take care of each other, to look out for the common man and womankind and all that are around us, and creation as well, that doesn't sound like something that is so far off base. Now, when we, when we put the, the scaffolding and structures of religion around it, that's when it starts getting weird and twisted and going awry. But simply put, it wasn't like, for, in, in Jesus' time, when he calls the disciples to come with him, it was to come with me and continue to come with me. And we want to, we want to make this into something that like somehow happens and me, pow, wow, 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 look at you. You somehow metamorphosized. You were something bad before, but now that you prayed a prayer, you're something good. You were crappy before, but now you're good. No, 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 no. See, again, that's more shame talk. God loved us before. God loves us now. God wants us to continue to love us. And for those, like for those that have kids or friends or anyone, good Lord, if any of you have been a human, have you ever had a friend that continues just to make bad decisions and you really, 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 really try to help them? Like bad decisions where you're like, oh my gosh, come on, come on, come on, come on. I just want to help you. I want to help you. I feel like that's God's nature towards humanity. It's not this angry God that is like wrath. Like wrath is boiling over all the time. That's, that's what I was raised with. Because I think, I think that we have put way, way, way too much, too much on salvation and not enough with walking out faith. Because we've turned salvation, not the idea, the act that I have been saved, that I've been redeemed, which is what the word should mean. In Christianity, we've turned it into something, a very hollow, small act and saying, I have it now because I didn't have it before. Now that I have it, I'm going to learn just to be a Christian a-hole. And then I'll be good. As long as I can learn to be an a-hole and judge people, yes, no, no, no. And then people will say, okay, Stuart, then well, what about God's wrath and all of this? And I don't want to get too theolo theological under this, but here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, if God is a God of love in the New Testament, then that would also go as far to tell us that God was a God of love in the Old Testament. Well, Stuart, what about scripture where God had wrath and his wrath was pouring over and God liked things and he seemed to get like wrath horny all the time. Yeah. I also see, I also read the Bible and realize that they were called the children of Israel for a reason. I look at it also, <laughs> scripture, so total side note, as a progression of humanity through history as well. We have, we, we have scripture that spans thousands of years we're going to grow up as, as a culture and, and as humans. And I know right now it feels like we're really not very grown up, but we have. We've grown up a long way. Uh, and we continue to inch towards being better. So I think this whole thing with salvation, Jesus dying and God needing wrath, I, I, think it's, I think it's all blown out of proportion. I would tell you that Jesus died because he was a political figure and because religious people wanted him gone and because Rome didn't want the mess on their hands of having to deal with another uprising. So is death. Here's how I like to frame it like this. Jesus was dead in the tomb three days. We've all been raised with this. I like to just think of it like this, is that Jesus kind of really just gave us all three days head start on grace. Okay, so since none of you are over 2,000 years old, so grace has a three-day head start on you, actually like a 2,000 years and blah, 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 how many days head start on you. That Jesus has already gone ahead. Grace is already there for you. You don't want it? Fine, but it's there. You don't believe it? Fine, it's there. God still loves you. And I think that's the simplicity of the gospel. I think that is the absolute simplicity of the gospel, is that God loves you where you are at, period. Period. Because I know as an evangelist, people would say, but he loves you too much to leave you there. I actually want to just end on the first part with that. God loves you. 
I remember I was, when I worked for an evangelistic organization, not one of my fine, I actually think it's one of my finer moments, but probably <laughs> I was, I'd, I'd worked for them for a number of years. And so I was on the leadership board of the organization. We had an all staff meeting where our uh, CEO leader, whatever the guy in charge um, was giving us this, this whole like speech about reaching youth and, you know, when kids go off to college, they lose their faith at a rate of blah, 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 stats, stats, stats. And he's like, do you know why? And stands there quiet. All the staff are quiet. And I, for some reason, was still an adult at this period. I raised my hand. As, I was like, you want to know why? I think the question was rhetorical, but something popped up in my head. And, and he's like, sure. Why, Stuart? Why do you think? Why are students losing their faith when they go off to college. And I said, it's because they never had a faith to begin with. They never understood what faith was. And I didn't realize at that moment I had completely throttled his entire thesis for his speech, which is never very good when you say something that <laughs> is counter to your speech. Yeah, not a great move. But I stand by that. I, I really think that faith isn't that hard. Loving others isn't that hard. The ways of Jesus aren't that hard. But I just think that what we've done in the church is we've shown people that faith is part of a system. Faith means you go to classes or groups or worship services. Faith means you do this. But you know the funny thing is, Faith means you help your neighbor. Oh, on missions trips, on missions days. Faith means you help your neighbor on the holidays when we're doing something we want to brag about. No, no. And that's the thing. Grace isn't sexy. God's grace is, I mean, it should be the sexiest thing ever, but it, it doesn't always sell. Hey, guess what? God already loves you. You're free. What? What? No, 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 no. We, we, we need to, okay, fine. And this is what the good Baptists and others have done. We had to turn it into a selling feature. If you don't take God's grace, what will happen? You die. How do you die? Painfully, horribly. This loving God wants to love you, but if he doesn't, he's like a really, really bad possessive boyfriend. <laughs> I love you so much. I have to hurt you. <laughs> yeah. And I will tell you, I will tell you for certain, um, and working for an evangelistic organization and being a per through a, a person who is fairly decent, I would say, at communicating to a crowd of people, a person who is communicated in front of large crowds of, of people. It is not hard. It is not hard to sway the emotions of people. And once I realized that swaying people's emotions was a main tool for evangelism, it made me feel sick. And I realized where I had done it too. I know how to, I, it, is, it is not hard to do that from the stage. And once I realized that, I was like, ah, gosh, God, I thought I was being taught a system of a way to do things to evangelize, and I realize I've just become a coercive idiot who is selling nothing. Because that was one of my questions that I had when I was working for that, organiz that, uh, that evangelistic organization, and it was a question I constantly pushed back always, was what is, the, what is the gospel? What is the kingdom of God? And what I found was within Christian circles, the easier and tinier and more narrow that you make those definitions, the easier it is to sell. And the easier it is to raise money, if I'm being honest. So if we can make the, what we're selling very simple, if we can make the need very dire, we can get more money off it. But if you begin to tell people, because this is what I, I had done. I, 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 when, when I was working for that organization, I, I was working with kids that were like inner city kids. And, and the, the, the thing that, it, that had stuck out to me most clearly was this, that I could, I could share with them the gospel of Jesus and tell them they need Jesus and they need Jesus to live a better life. Uh, but really for them, a better life was parents that don't hit me or, uh, consistent meals or a safe place to sleep. 
So Jesus loves me didn't work. But, but, like inviting them into a kingdom of God, into a family of people that were there to help them was very different. So again, this is why I was very weird <laughs> working for the organization because I at least had enough autonomy to where I, I set up a center <laughs> where we could work with people to see what the kingdom of God would look like being transitional in, in, in real, real and tangible ways. Because I think if the kingdom of God is not tangible, it's nothing to us. The kingdom of God must be made tangible. Jesus was a manifestation of the kingdom of God. He was a continuing message of what the kingdom of God was supposed to be and could be. And a reminder to us that we are loved where we are at and that we need to continue to move with that and move others in that direction to realize that they are loved. Not this love the sinner, hate the sin BS. No, no. You love the person. End stop. That God loves the person. End stop. And that should be the simplicity of the gospel is that because God loves you, because you are made in God's image, that you, you are owed dignity and that you have family and that you matter and that you matter to the kingdom that God is moving forward because other people need your strength and need what you have to give. So in ending this conversation, I, I probably think that I might as well bring up the article that I quoted <laughs> that never I, I brought up but never quoted from um, because I did, I did, I did. I found it quite excellent. And again, I'm going to give credit for this. This is uh, from Jason Elam. Does getting saved stunt our spiritual growth? And, and, and I do. I, I, I love this part of it. And I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. Um, when Jesus called people to repentance, he wasn't talking about renouncing sin. He was talking about opening our minds to the good news that the kingdom of God had come near. Jesus came to a Jewish culture that had been crying out to God in prayer for a king and Messiah to come and set them free from Roman oppression. Jesus called the people of his day to repent, literally learn to think differently because they were expecting the Messiah to come as a military leader to conquer their enemies with violence. As a nonviolent Messiah, Jesus knew that many of his culture would miss the reality of his present kingdom. He called them to repent of their expectations rooted in fear and reset their expectations around the heart of God. Jesus taught his followers to renounce their fear and violence. He taught them to love and care for their neighbors, including those who would consider themselves enemies. By calling humanity to feed the hungry, heal the sick, and visit those in prison, Jesus reset his disciples' focus into loving others. That, 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 my friends, is everything. Because if we get hung up on salvation being something that we need to do to get out of something else, we're missing the huge something else that salvation is calling us to see. We're missing the beauty of the kingdom of God. We're missing the beauty of what Jesus has called us to. I've said this before, and I will say this again, and I believe this wholeheartedly. You will never, ever understand the gospel of Jesus by reading it. You will only understand the gospel of Jesus by doing it. If we only read it, it's something like philosophy that we can agree to in our heads. By doing it, it changes us. By getting our hands dirty, it changes us. By investing in other people's lives, it changes us. By giving of ourselves, it changes us. By us realizing that we are not the center of the effing universe, it changes us. Because it shows us that we are well loved by God. We are so well loved by God. We are supposed to go and love in the same way and live in a sacrificial way that is reckless, but that tells everyone else that you matter. You are loved. You have worth. You have value. Because that is why Jesus came and died. That is what he showed us, that we are called to be like him, to just lay it down for other people. 
and it is a better way, and it is good news, and it does turn us away from being obsessed with ourselves, which oddly enough, these days, kind of seems like the American church, the American church and the pastors, a lot of whining from the Christian crazy. People are very obsessed with needing our services, and we need this. I can't be a Christian unless I go to church. But Jesus would tell you, uh, you can't be, just go be a Christian. That's how you be a Christian. Go love people. That's how you be a Christian. Go help people. That's how you be a Christian. Go to church. That doesn't mean anything. That means you're a spectator. So, to go be a Christian means for you to go out into this week and to live in a way where you love people Love people the way that God loves you, full of grace and compassion and recklessly. You want to love them and help them and bring them out of where they're at so they too can see that they are loved by God. I send you out this week with the holiest amount of grace and snark and peace. Go live out your salvation. Because talking about it or having it on a piece of paper is pretty worthless. Let's go ahead and live this stuff out. Is that kind of what God wanted all along? I'm out of here this week. I'll see you guys again. Peace!